Right, so let us consider differential equations beyond Barnard spaces. So as um, you should have seen uh, in an analysis or calculus lecture, there are uh, up to Barnard spaces. So the usual theory of ordinary differential equations um, holds basically without any, any major obstacles. So what do I mean by this? Um, so the statement I'm after is, uh, so if E is a Banach space uh, and you have curves uh, Y and a vector field F on the Banach space, so maybe time dependent, and you want to consider the ordinary differential equation Y prime is equal to F of TY with some initial condition, then uh, the usual statement, for example, using the car iteration, is that um, this initial value problem has a unique solution at least for a small time interval around uh, the initial time, which in this case is zero, if the right-hand side of your differential equation is Lipschitz continuous. Um, this, is, this is sort of the standard uh, first result on ordinary differential equations you learn in a course on uh, what, what ordinary differential equations probably. So the nice thing is this also works um, fine on, um, on Barnack spaces. Um, However, what we, what we will consider now, we'll look at several examples where um, uh, it will be immediate that uh, this existence and uniqueness theory for ordinary differential equations breaks down as soon as we just step a little bit outside of the realm of Barnack spaces. So let's, uh, let's have uh, a look at several examples um, for uh, this behavior. So let me switch over to the... Um, draw, uh, to the writing again. So um, let's consider. Uh, okay, examples for uh, differential equations. Beyond. Barnack spaces. Uh, which are ill behaved. Okay. And um, so let us start with uh, an example which you can also find in the appendix, so it's A35. And we consider the space Rn. Basically, you can think of this as all sequences, or um, so on one hand, one guy says so all the sequences without any restrictions, uh, all real sequences. Um, and uh, or as a topological vector space, this is the same as you take the countable product of copies of the reals and endow this with the product topology. And um, to be explicit, let me um, let me just uh, write down. So this uh, um, R n is a Frechet space, so not only a topological vector space or a locally convex space, but it's also metrizable. And let me just give you the metric D of uh, Xn, Yn. So how do you measure the distance between those sequences? So we take this construction, since we have infinitely many contributions, so we take um, Xn minus Yn, Again, we have to normalize as we did it yesterday. And uh, then to make it converge, we multiply with this. So this metric gives us a, uh, gives a topology or this, it uses an equivalent topology uh, to the product topology and turns this uh, space into a freshy space. Uh, if you want to do this, so since, since we are learning about locally convex spaces. Another description is um, so um, a generating family. Uh, 
of semi norms for this topology is uh, given by the semi norms pn uh, so when you insert uh, what it's called a pm insert one of this is this is just measuring the absolute value of the mth entry these ones right and then thinking back to, uh, at uh, the introduction of locally convex spaces yesterday we see that we have countably many of these semi norms and uh, this uh, they have been just uh, combined together to give this metric up here in the the usual way okay However, uh, what I want to show you is a, is a differential equation on uh, this fresh air space, which um, um, uh, has too many solutions, basically. So and for this, uh, we define the left shift lambda. So this takes a sequence and spits out another sequence. And uh, what it does, so if you have a sequence x1, x2, x3, and so forth, it sends it to the sequence x2, x3, and, and so forth. So it deletes the first entry and uh, shifts all the other entries one to the left. And that's why it's called the left shift. So obviously, lambda is linear. And um, continuous. Right. So um, for the continuity, all we need to observe is um, if you have p n lambda of uh, sorry, m lambda of x n. So this is the same as um, the absolute value of x m plus one, or in other words, this is p m plus one of this sequence x n, and. Uh, this is already enough. This uh, relation to deduce uh, continuity. So what we uh, what we basically see is um, if um, uh, we have uh, uh, p m uh, semi norm ball, uh, let's say all in the pm semi norm of radius epsilon around some sequence xn so what is the inverse image under this one um, well this can just be identified. So uh, if we take the inverse image under the left shift, this is basically shifting the stuff to the right and then inserting a zero in the, in the front or something we, we don't really care. And um, so we can express this as a ball uh, in the PM plus one norm of the epsilon, uh, of radius epsilon around a sequence where uh, Perhaps we write it like this, 0, x1, x2, so forth. Actually, the 0 is not important here. We can, we can insert anything we want here. Um, so basically, this shows that the, that the left shift is continuous. OK. Um, so um, we thus uh, can consider a differential equation. Uh, y prime of t is equal to lambda um, 
of y of t. So um, this is a linear differential equation. Um, with a smooth right-hand side. And if we were on a Banach space, then we would immediately know that um, we get a unique solution. And well, okay, I mean, since this is very simple, so it's a linear equation, then, uh, I mean, what you uh, what you would even get here in the in the Banach space that you would global existence and uniqueness of the solution, right? Um, okay, however, so when we look at this differential equation, um, so differential equation is equivalent to uh, the system of equations y i prime of t uh, being equal to y i plus one of t, where uh, the y i are the components of y. Okay, and um, so how do we uh, uh, how do we solve such a system? Well, I mean, the this is now a trivial observation if one knows one-dimensional uh, calculus. Or, uh, so, uh, what I claim is now that this system has infinitely many solutions. And how do you construct these solutions? So um, let phi be a smooth mapping from the reals to the reals, which uh, vanishes near uh, zero. Um, then we can define um, the following curve, y of t is equal to uh, the nth derivative of uh, the phi of t. And uh, now when we, when we look at this, just by construction of the curve, um, this solves the equation, right? Um, and well, so the nice the nice thing here is uh, obviously fu uh, smooth functions which uh, on on the reals which vanish somewhere near zero. So we want a small neighborhood around zero where this function vanishes. So they are not unique. So we can find uh, infinitely many solutions. Uh, and this, uh, this is the system or the linear equation does not have a unique solution. And this is now completely different to the situation on Barnack spaces, where we have, if the right-hand side of our ordinary differential equation is, uh, is nice, well, we don't get a nice solution. Okay. Um, so this is an, uh, an example of a linear differential equation which has all too many um, uh, solutions. Now let's uh, consider another example where we have a differential equation which uh, has <laughs> too few solutions, um, na namely there are, there's none of, of these solutions. Okay, so uh, let us define another space, E. And again, we take all sequences in the space we just had, uh, such that 
almost all xn are leak, uh, 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 zero. Um, so uh, almost all means on, uh, for each of these sequence only finitely many are no, uh, allowed to be non-zero. Right? And uh, so we endow this uh, space with uh, the box topology. So what is the box topology? Um, this is uh, the topology generated by the open sets or by um, by the basis of uh, sets. Take the product of U n, an infinite product, where U n is some open subset of the reals. So this is the box topology, um, and um, well, let's note several things. Which you will check in the um, uh, in the exercises. First of all, or for us most important, the box topology turns E into a locally convex space. E is neither uh, Barnack space nor a Fréché space. So the topology, I mean, this box topology is uh, somewhat wild. And in, but uh, so we are, we are not going to check that this is not uh, Fréché or Barnack space, but okay, so this is perhaps a little bit more for the, uh, again, for general education. However, um, what we uh, what we uh, what one should see is, I mean, obviously, just by definition, so the E is sitting inside of the space R n of all sequences. However, the box topology is not the subspace topology induced. Uh, Induced by all the sequences. I mean, on one hand, if it were, then uh, E would be a, a fresh A space. However, uh, since I, will, I want to make this point, so um, in the uh, subspace topology, open neighborhoods are of the form you have uh, you start with u1 times u2 times and so forth times un for some n in the natural numbers u1 up to un open subsets in the reals and then after this finite index, you get then only copies of the reals. So you know, for the rest of the things, we take n and n, uh, n, no. so probably should write m in m, m strictly larger than n. Right, so this is a typical open neighborhood in the product topology. In a product, the tro product topology allows us only to control up to finitely many of the uh, of the of the components of the series uh, of the sequence. Uh, whereas the box topology, when you look at this here, so the box topology is is much finer than the product topology. It allows us to control everything or every component simultaneously. So. Um, Open neighborhoods are, are in general uh, 
constructed from infinitely many open sets, whereas product topology open neighborhoods are only constructed from finitely many open sets, which are different from the real, or uh, from, from the space from which they are constructed, and then for the rest, uh, you get always the same space. Okay, however, we want to look at an, at an operator here. So uh, let's construct the right shift operator from E to E which does the following. So you take sequence and you shift it to the right and insert a zero in the first component. Okay. Um, so again, uh, R is continuous. Uh, sorry, is what to say linear, linear is clear. And it is not hard to see. That the right shift is continuous. So what happens? Um, what is the pre image of uh, such an open box neighborhood? Well, this is everything which, uh, once we have to right shift it, um, well, so if u1 contain, uh, so if zero is contained in u1, uh, then the pre-image is uh, just, um, the product starting uh, with u2. Uh, sorry, ah, I need to write it, of course, like, uh, like this. n plus 1. And if 0 is not sitting in u1, then uh, we get the empty set. So all of these guys are open in the box topology, so this uh, gives you continuity. OK, and let's consider again a um, an initial value problem so we want that uh, the derivative of y is the right shifted y and y of zero is given by the sequence which has a one at the first uh, uh, entry and then zeros afterwards. Okay, so what does this differential equation tell us? So uh, let's just do uh, math here on uh, in the upper row. So we see that we have here zero, y1, y2, so of course writing again in components. And uh, so we get y1, uh, derivative of y1 of t, needs to be 0. Uh, so by just comparing the first component on the right-hand side with the first component on the left-hand side, uh, or in other words, since this is just a di uh, differential equation in the reals, we see that uh, y1 of t needs to be constant equal to 1, right? because of our initial condition we have here. Um, OK. Uh, then we can continue. Now we know what y1 is. So we are now working in the second component here and compare the second component on the left-hand side of the y prime series with the second component on the right-hand side. So we know that y prime uh, of the uh, so second component, the derivative of this, is uh, equal to 1. Okay, or in other words, y2 uh, needs to be, uh, well, we know the initial condition, so that should be, uh, the initial condition is given here, so it should start at zero. So we need to have, uh, so the y2 uh, of t needs to be t. Okay, and um, well, continuing, 
in this fashion, we see, I mean, what is the solution or what is the general solution of this equation? So we have must have yi of t. This is will be given by ti to the first uh, t to the i minus first power divided by i minus one factorial right, by iteratively integrating and inserting these things. Um, however, if uh, t is not zero, we always obtain a sequence with um, infinitely many Uh, entries which are non-zero. Um, hence, uh, the sequence y of t does not lie in or space E, because the space E only contains sequences which are eventually zero. Um, for So for all T, say, bigger than zero, this so uh, the thing which needs to be the solution is not contained in, uh, in the space. And what we deduce, that um, the initial value problem does not have a solution. In E. So we have a nice locally convex space. We have an initial value problem whose right hand side is given by a continuous linear uh, operator on this infinite dimensional space. And uh, yet, uh, not only does the solution not exist for all time, basically it doesn't exist outside of the initial time. So we can only uh, solve this differential equation in the space we want to solve it in um, with respect to the, uh, to the initial time, uh, but not for any further time. So this uh, is a differential equation beyond the Banach space, which has, uh, well, no solutions beyond the initial one or the trivial solution, which, which uh, uh, is uh, just giving you the uh, the solution at the at the initial time. So uh, this is this is another example of a badly behaved um, well of a of a badly behaved uh, differential e equation on uh, a more general space. Okay, and. Um, one reason of why these equations behave so badly outside of Banach space is that there is, uh, or that in general, um, for example, the inverse function theorem fails. Uh, so this is this is sort of uh, you can you can basically connect these uh, differential equations and uh, the failure of them having uh, having a nice solution. Um, you can basically. Uh, connect this to the failure of the inverse function theorem. Let me give you another example of uh, of such a uh, of such an ill-behaved differential equation, um, which uh, is a bit foreshadowing uh, shadowing what we will be doing in the second chapter uh, this afternoon. Um, so we consider again. The Fréchet space of smooth mappings from the unit interval with values in the reals with uh, the compact open C infinity topology. So this was yesterday constructed uh, rigorously in the, in the exercises. If you've done the exercises, and uh, what we've done. Also in the exercise is we looked at the differential operator d, which takes a smooth function and uh, sends it to uh, 
a smooth function, namely it sends it to um, the derivative. So um, what's happening here? So f is sent to um, f dot, or in other words, this is df. Here we have dot and then it's set to one in the Bastiani notation. So this is uh, a continuous linear um, map with respect to the C infinity topology. Um, and what we want to do, we consider now the initial value problem. given as follows. So we um, search for something, d dt f of t is equal to d of f, or in other words, so f dot. Okay, and here, um, ah, okay, let's Let's be a bit careful here. Perhaps uh, this notation looks now. Let, let me not write f dot. Let me uh, let me write it like this. Uh, and f of zero should be some function f naught. Okay. Uh, let's do a comment here. So we have f. Let's say we are searching for a function which is defined on a small time interval and takes, uh, takes values in uh, the space of functions, right? Um, so that's why this f dot notation might be a bit misleading now. So which dot do you, uh, do you mean by that? So here, uh, this d dt contribution, this means a derivative of this curve as a curve into this infinite dimensional space of functions. However, what the d operator is doing um, is it takes a, a derivative not with respect to the variable t. So here we have the variable t, which gets sent to f of t. And this f of t, this is now a function from 0, 1 with values in the reals. And um, so we can basically send, uh, we get another parameter s this s gets sent to f of t of s. So we have a, um, we have a, we have a mapping, which is called f wedge of, um, well, of two variables now. On the one hand, we have the t variable from before, and we have the other time variable from zero, one. So this is now a function of two variables. So it sends t and s to f of t of s. Okay, and what the equation here means, um, so the above equation, means the following. Um, so we have, uh, if we are now phrasing everything with the help of the f wedge. So what's going on here? So the f wedge, since this is now a very, uh, function of two variables, I have to write it as follows. So I have to take the time derivative dt, or partial t, of f wedge. And uh, so the equation upstairs here means, so the time derivative, or partial derivative with respect to t, of the f wedge should be the same, and the d here takes the derivative with respect to the variable s. So dt of f wedge is the same as d uh, as partial s of f wedge t s. So this is a partial differential equation, at least in this notation. And uh, what we want is f uh, wedge of zero s should be the same as f0 of s. So this is a rewrite 
in another notation of, uh, of the above um, equation. Again, um, a little bit like in the introductory lecture, what I'm, uh, what I'm hiding here, I'm uh, cheating. Um, it is unclear now whether the derivative uh, d dt of f of t, or that's the same as f prime of t, um, really corresponds. to this partial derivative of the f wedge. Um, this will be one of the major results of chapter two. And uh, this result has a name, it is called the exponential law. Okay, let's let's believe for a moment that uh, that this identification makes sense, and you can really justify that uh, you get this partial differential equation with the initial values. Um, okay, so um, okay, how, how uh, what I want to do now? Uh, um, I want to see that this uh, partial differential equation. It's not by three that this has, um, well, we shall see now, that A3 has infinitely many solutions. And uh, how do we do this? Um, so we have our function F0, which is a smooth function on uh, zero one with values in the reals. And now there are, well, let's, let's take out the big guns. Uh, so by the Whitney extension theorem, there are infinitely many uh, extensions f naught. So this should be a smooth function now defined on a larger interval from 0 to 2, say, um, with values in the reals, uh, which satisfy if I restrict f naught, uh, the capital f naught to this interval 0, 1, then I get my original mapping back. Actually, you don't, I mean, the Whitney extension theorem is a little bit. Uh, a big gun for such an easy problem, so there are easier ways to see that these extensions exist. Basically, you could, you could compute the Taylor series at uh, uh, at a point and then see that uh, you can continue uh, a little bit beyond that point by taking a function which, has the, uh, which exists on the on the right hand side, the boundary point one, has the same Taylor expansion. So this is um, there are easier versions than this Whitney extension theorem. Anyway, um, so. What we then define is we define the function, uh, it's not it's f all the time, let's define the function g of uh, t and s. And we just say this is f naught of uh, t plus s um, for t and s in the integral from 0 to 1. And uh, then uh, it is easy to see that um, G of TS solves um, A3. Uh, let's do this. So G of 0 of S, so this is F naught is 0 plus S, or in other words, since it restricts, so it's F naught of S. The initial condition is okay. Now we take the partial derivative of uh, 
uh, g of t s and um, right uh, so this is just the uh, partial derivative of uh, f or t dt of f naught t plus s so basically it's the derivative of um, our function uh, f naught at uh, the point t plus s and well if we do it the other way around then get the dds f naught t plus s um, this is ds g ds okay um Right, so since extension is non-unique, we get infinitely many solutions. Of the differential equation. All right, so this is another example of, uh, well, I mean, the only thing which is not clear at the moment why, uh, again, this linear differential equation on the function space should be equal to this uh, partial differential equation we have here. I mean, on one hand, I mean, there are actually two sides to this problem, right? So on one hand, I claimed uh, that if we start out with this initial value problem, Call it a2, then this gives you the uh, initial value problem a3. Conversely, uh, I mean, it's, it's all nice that we can identify uh, derivatives and so forth, but uh, what is also not clear is, is the converse direction. Say we have something which solves a3, why does it also solve um, a2? Right. So uh, the uh, this exponential law, which we will uh, encounter in the next section should better provide a solution or uh, uh, some justification of why we cannot only go say, uh, I mean, uh, we, have, we have basically two ways to this bridge. So uh, from A2 to A3, uh, this basically allows us to describe something which happens on this infinite dimensional space of mappings as something which happens on purely finite dimensional terms. So we get these two, um, uh, we get these functions of two variables, and we uh, somehow can justify that the derivative of the function taking uh, values in the function space has something to do with the derivatives of the functions of two variables. However, uh, if we now say, okay, let's study uh, PDEs, like the, the one in A3, uh, and we have a solution to this, then, of course, also you know uh, that we need to get backwards. So we have a solution now, which is... Um, a mapping of two variables and you have to uh, construct from the smooth mapping of two variables we have to construct a, a mapping which goes again back into uh, this infinite dimensional space of functions and uh, then it's also smooth again and uh, so this is something we will deal with in the second uh, chapter of how uh, this correspondence uh, can be justified and uh, I mean not only why does it hold but also what are the consequences of this um, so-called exponential law. <laughs>